Shabbat Shalom. This is Larry Mitchell with Friends of Israel. Today we are going to be looking at a minor holiday. It's called Tisha B'Av. It simply means the ninth day of the month of Av, which is a Jewish month occurring around the time of our August. It was on this day in 586 B.C. that King Nebuchadnezzar destroyed the first temple. It was on the same date in 70 A.D. that Titus destroyed the second temple. We read about the destruction of the first temple in 2 Chronicles 36, 15 to 17. And the Lord God of their fathers sent warnings to them by his messengers, rising up early and sending them because he had compassion on his people and on his dwelling place. But they mocked the messengers of God, despised his words, scoffed at his prophets until the wrath of the Lord arose against his people, till there was no remedy. Therefore he brought against them the king of the Chaldeans, who killed their young men with the sword in the house of their sanctuary, and had no compassion on the young men or virgin, on the aged or on the weak. He gave them all into his hand. Now Jesus foretold the destruction of the second temple, which also took place on Tisha B'Av, in Luke 19, 41 to 44. Now as Jesus drew near, he saw the city and wept over it, saying, If you had known, even you, especially in this your day, the things that make for your peace, but now they are hidden from your eyes. For the days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment around you, surround you and close you in on every side, and level you and your children within you to the ground. And they will not leave in you one stone upon another, because you did not know the time of your visitation. You know, back in the days of Zechariah, several Jewish leaders came to Zechariah because the temple was being rebuilt, and they wanted to know, they wanted to know whether the Lord would have them to continue commemorating the destruction of the temple on the ninth of Av. We read about that in Zechariah 7, 1 to 3. Now in the fourth year of King Darius, it came to pass, the word of the Lord came to Zechariah in the fourth day of the ninth month, Kislev, when the people sent Sherezir with Regem Melech and his men to the house of God to pray before the Lord and to ask the priests who were in the house of the Lord of hosts and the prophet saying, Should I weep in the fifth month? and fast as I've done for so many years? And Zechariah gives the answer from the Lord in Zechariah 4, 7, 4 to 7. Then the Lord of the hosts came to me, saying, Say to all the people of the land and to the priest, When you fasted and mourned in the fifth and seventh months during those 70 years, did you really fast for me, for me? When you eat and when you drink, do, do not you eat and drink for yourselves? Should you not have obeyed the words which the Lord proclaimed to the former prophets when Jerusalem and the cities around it were inhabited and prosperous and the south and the low land were inhabited? You know, when the temple was destroyed in 70 AD, biblical Judaism was forced to come to an end. Why do I say that? Because central to biblical Judaism was the blood sacrifice. And the only place they could perform the blood sacrifice was on the Temple Mount. Leviticus 17, verse 11. For the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I've given it to you upon the altar to make an atonement for your souls, for it is the blood that makes an atonement for your souls. Deuteronomy 12, 5 and 6. But you shall seek the place where the Lord your God chooses. Out of all the tribes put his name for his dwelling place, and there you shall go. There you shall take your burnt offerings, your sacrifices, your tithes, 
your heath offerings of your hand, your vowed offerings, your freewill offerings, and the firstborn of your herds and flocks. <clears throat> when the Jews were denied access to the Temple Mount, they will, were no longer able to perform the blood sacrifice. And they replaced biblical Judaism with rabbinical Judaism, saying prayer, good works, and charity have replaced the need for a blood sacrifice. And that change came about because the Jewish people no longer had access to the temple. The temple was destroyed by the Romans. Now, interesting, there is a promise in the book of Zechariah that God will turn Tisha B'Av into a day of rejoicing. Zechariah 8.19, thus says the Lord of hosts, the fast of the fourth month, the fast of the fifth, the fast of the seventh, and the fast of the tenth shall be joy and gladness and cheerful feast for the house of Judah. Therefore, love, truth, and peace. Well, the rabbis looking at that wondered, how could, Tisha, how could God turn Tisha B'Av, the remembrance of the destruction of the first and second temple, into a time of rejoicing? And they theorized that it would be on Tisha B'Av that the Jewish people would re start rebuilding the third temple. And you find in the writings, especially amongst Orthodox Jews, a connection between Tisha B'Av and the rebuilding of the temple. This is from an article from the Chabad website. The Holy Temple in Jerusalem was built by King Solomon in the year 2928 from creation, or 833 B.C., and was destroyed 410 years later on the ninth day of Av, by the armies of the Babylonian emperor. Seventy years later, it was rebuilt. The second temple stood for 420 years until its destruction by the Romans, also on the ninth of Av, in 3829 or 69 AD. Ever since the ninth of Av has been a day of fasting and repentance, a day in which we mourn the destruction and pray for the coming of the Mashiach, or Messiah, when the third and final temple will be restored to its place as the divine epicenter of the universe. Now, Bible-believing Christians understand the third temple must be rebuilt and must be standing during the tribulation period. But sadly, all Christians do not believe what the Bible teaches. I received a letter by, sent by someone who believes the church is the new Israel, and he sent a letter arguing that the third temple will never be rebuilt. Let me just read an excerpt from his letter. The only temple in which God is now and forever will be pleased to dwell is Jesus Christ and the church, his spiritual body. It would be an expression of the worst imaginable regression to suggest that God would ever sanction the rebuilding of the temple. It would be denial of the word became flesh and dwelt among us. It would be a repudiation of the church as the temple of God and thus an affront to the explicit affirmation of Paul. Well, that last statement tells me that this man does not know does not understand or is ignorant of what Paul actually taught about the third temple. For Paul spoke of the rebuilding of the temple in 2 Thessalonians 2, 2 and 3. Let no one deceive you by any means, for that day will not come unless the falling away comes first, and the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition. He's talking about the Antichrist who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he sits as God, look where he's going to sit, in the temple of God, 
showing himself that he is God. Here Paul makes reference to that third temple and he calls it the temple of God. I guess this writer was not familiar with the writings of the Apostle Paul. Now that third temple will be defiled by the Antichrist at the midpoint of the tribulation period. But in Revelation, God calls that third temple his temple. And he will send his two witnesses to minister in the temple. Revelation 11.1 1. Then I was given a reed like a measuring rod. And the angel stood saying, Rise and measure the temple of God. It's not the Antichrist temple. It's God's temple. Rise and measure the temple of God, the altar, and those who worship there. And then Revelation 11, 3 and 4. And I will give power to my two witnesses. And they will prophesy 1,260 days, three and a half years, clothed in sackcloth. These are two olive trees and two lampstands standing before God of the earth. So God's going to have that re third temple rebuilt. He's going to send his two witnesses to minister in that third temple. How close are we to the rebuilding of the temple? There's a little store on Ben Yehuda Street in Jerusalem. I like to visit there. It's got all sorts of interesting artifacts. But in the front window, it has a display of the model of the third temple. And it's got a little sign exhorting people to buy now before that third temple is rebuilt because the price is going to go up when the third temple is rebuilt. In Jerusalem, there are two groups working zealously for the rebuilding of the temple, the Temple Faithful and the Temple Institute. It wasn't that long ago that these two institutes were considered lunatic fringe, way out there, uh, voices in the wilderness. No one was paying attention to them. But if you notice this next picture, is taken in Jerusalem on Tisha B'Av. And here we see thousands of Jews gathering on Tisha B'Av, praying for the rebuilding of the third temple. Two of my friends who live on the outskirts of Jerusalem are Micah and Shoshana Harari. They have a little factory called Harari Harps. And they're building harps to be used when the Messiah returns to the third temple. Micah shared with me that he's got a very special project right now. His harps are beautiful pieces of art. But he's working on a very special harp. One that he will present to the Messiah, who he believes well, like David, will be playing the harp during the Messianic Kingdom. Now there's a Canadian who made Aliyah to Israel. Her name is Jenna Lewitsky. She is a shepherdess. And not only her, but a, a uh, herd, a flock of sheep called Jacob's sheep have come back and they've settled in Megal Edar, the Tower of the Flock, located in the fields just outside of Bethlehem. The same place where the lambs were raised for the Passover during the time of Jesus. And those lambs have come home. And it is believed those lambs will be used for the sacrifice when the third temple has been built. You know, the cornerstone has been rebuilt or has been cut. 
for the erection of the third temple. The Sanhedrin, 70 spiritual leaders, have been reestablished. All the priestly clothing have been sewn. They're in storage. For when the third temple begins to be constructed, the priest will be clothed in the priestly garments. All the temple furniture has been reconstructed with the exception of the Ark of the Covenant, which they believe is lying underneath the Dome of the Rock. They have, been, they have started practicing sacrifice on the Western Wall on some Passovers. They are ready to rebuild. You know, we have a video which we offer to, to uh, people who come on our website, ready to rebuild, revisited. If this kind of information excites you, you might want to purchase this video from our store. You know, a few years ago, I heard a visiting rabbi from Jerusalem speaking about the preparations to rebuild the temple. And he made a very interesting observation. He declared that he came from a generation that had to fight for the reestablishment of Israel. And he believes that his generation is disqualified as David was because they were engaged in war for their very survival. It was Solomon, a man of peace, who God appointed to rebuild or to build the temple. He says that he fought in the War of Independence. His children fought in the Six-Day War, in the Yom Kippur War. But his grandchildren have been raised, relatively speaking, in a time of peace. And he believes it'll be his grandchildren, the generation which is rising up, who will rebuild the temple. The reason why he believed that Solomon, or why he, their grandchildren rebuilt the temple, was that Solomon was a man of peace and he rebuilt, or he built the temple. First Chronicles 22, 7 to 10. And David said to Solomon, My son, as for me, it was in my mind to build a house to the name of the Lord my God. But the word of the Lord came to me, saying, You have shed much blood and have made great wars. You shall not build a house for my name, because you have shed much blood on the earth in my sight. Behold, a son shall be born to you, who shall be a man of rest. And I will give him rest from all his enemies all around. His name shall be Solomon. And I will give peace and quietness to Israel in his days. He shall build a house for my name. And he shall be my son, and I will be his father. And I will establish the throne of his kingdom over Israel forever. You know, with his Abrahamic peace accords, I'm reminded of 1 Thessalonians 5, 2 and 3. For you yourselves know perfectly the day of the Lord so comes as a thief in the night. For when they shall say, Peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them as labor planes upon a pregnant woman, and they shall not escape. It may be that the Lord will use this time of peace to get the children of Israel to rebuild that third temple. But one of the hindrances to the rebuilding of the third temple has been Islam, which has been opposed to the rebuilding of the temple because it would mean that the Dome of the Rock would have to be replaced by the third temple. But recently there have been some developments which seems to be a changing of a heart of many Muslims. In an article 
from 2009 entitled Muslim Leader Wants Temple Rebuilt. Let me just read this article, this segment from this article. An historically unprecedented development, a famous Turkish Muslim leader and prominent group of Israeli rabbis have joined together on one of their declared goals to rebuild the Jewish temple in Jerusalem. Adnan Oktar, who uses the pen name of Harun Ya, ya is a controversial but highly influential Muslim intellectual and author of over 65 million of his books in circulation worldwide. Oktar recently met with three representatives from reestablished Jewish Sanhedrin, a group of 71 Orthodox and rabbis and scholars from Israel <clears throat> discuss how religious Muslims, Jews, and Christians can work together. And they're working together to rebuild that third temple. And then this article came out, Saudis come out against the Temple Mount. Now, talk, talking about the Jewish people, they're talking about the Palestinian Authority. Let me just read this. Among the most prominent messages in the campaign were those who wrote that the direction of the prayers of the Jews is not important to us. What is important to us is only our homeland, referring to Saudi Arabia. The tweet was written by a well-known Saudi cartoonist named Fad al-Jabiri. Another English-language tweet by Ib Tassim from Morocco seeks to bolster the Saudi campaign as emphasized that Temple Mount is of no particular importance to Muslims and hopes for the building of the Third Temple and arrival of peace with it for all peoples. You know, if this interests you, you might want to check out what in the world is going on March 10th, which is talking about the rebuilding of the temple and the Saudis and the Moroccans no longer seem to be as opposed to the rebuilding of the temple as they once were. As we seem to be moving, as we seem to be racing towards the rebuilding of the third temple, it reminds me of Jesus' exhortation, Luke 21, 28. Now when these things begin to happen, look up and lift up your heads because your redemption draweth nigh. This is Larry Mitchell with Friends of Israel. Shabbat Shalom.